this is quite an interesting topic because I think it's growing both in relevancy and in assets. So I think what I like about this panel is that we have representation from the product and the indexing side, but also from the user and the allocator side. So we're going to hear from sort of both sides of the both sides of the table. So I want to start off just quickly with some stats to maybe dismiss any objections, whether people are thinking, is the, is that, are people investing in these products? So I think for one, there's like a robot outside that's like serving candy <laughs> to people. So like maybe that's the future, I don't know. Um, but also, this chart up is thematic ETFs listed in the US, right? And this encompasses quite a few definitions. So ESG, robotics, infrastructure, things like that. There's about 21 billion or so in ETF assets in the US. To give you context, that's about the size of all the assets in discretionary ETFs in the US. It's bigger than the utility sector. It is bigger than the staple sector. So there's obviously some real money going into these types of products. And to not even forget about Europe, the largest tech ETF in Europe, it's not S&P tech, it's not Germany tech, it is a robotics ETF. It's the biggest product there. But thematics goes on way beyond just robotics, right? There's so many other, you know, that's a very broad definition. So I guess we'll start fundamentally with that, uh, James. Sort of, if I'm a client, how are you sort of defining what thematic investing is to me? Well, I'm going back to first principles and saying, what does the investor want? And the overwhelming majority of investors for whom I act want long-term real rates of return that can fund distributions within the context of a risk budget. And I worry that the toolkit of conventional investments simply leaves an awful lot on the table unutilized. So I would look at thematic exchange-traded funds, both for efficient representation of themes that we could do in segregated space, but actually struggle. We can come on to why that is in a while. But also to pick up factors which we reasonably believe will be co-located with superior long-term performance, where traditional methodologies for valuing securities are just really inadequate. And it's on this forward-looking basis that we are prepared to consider and do deploy money to ETFs that are with a thematic nature. Sure. Deborah, let me actually turn that over to you. Same thing, sort of, again, it's such a fluid definition. Sort of how do you explain thematic investing, you know, through your lens? Since I come from the global ESG index world, I'd probably get, take a little bit of an ESG angle. Um, investing in ESG is taking into consideration environment, social and governance alongside uh, financial uh, logic. And uh, with that, uh, there's been a very big boom. And uh, maybe the more interesting question is why is there a big boom in this area of environment, social governance, when uh, not that long ago, even five years ago, it was a tree-hugging exercise. And now we're seeing that as we move into something that's much more financially material, um, you're getting more mainstream investors involved. There's also a context that you can see from a world is changing, the investor is changing, and the data is evolving. And I think that is uh, part of the impetus of what, what we're seeing and why there's a big shift in terms of thematic investing on ESG, but also more broadly ESG as a theme. Yeah, sure. And he, you brought up something interesting about sort of the long term. Is that the way you need to approach thematic investing? Because I look at flows every day, right, and see some of these themes. There are flows going in and out of it. Are maybe like investors doing themselves a disservice by maybe chasing like these hot themes versus looking, taking a more long term? You know, not necessarily. Approach. I think we need to probably segment the market opportunity set in, into two. One which is about efficient representation of something that may be relatively ephemeral or tactical, and indeed also the long-term uh, opportunities. And so, for example, if we were to talk about a short-term opportunity, if investors had wanted to play the shale story, uh, I would say that trying to understand the detailed finances of uh, master funds and how limited liability partnerships are structured for pipelines is really quite complicated. And to get a portfolio approach for an ETF, I think unless you have an inordinate amount of time, dig into the detail of all of these uh, factors and characteristics is a much better way to play the story of the rise of shale. But that for me was tactical. It was an opportunity to be a participant in the story where one would take a position efficiently, one would close the position efficiently. The costs of so doing were very limited. Indeed, the ETF as a global vehicle provides much greater tax efficiency for a UK investor than had we bought the vehicles direct. And that, I think, is an important part of the story. On the other hand, the long-term story is, I think, just as important. So if we were to think about biotechnology, for example, I would say that 
looking at uh, medical devices, relatively straightforward industry, easy to understand, therefore easy to make investment decisions. Biotech, on the other hand, really difficult to see who's going to genuinely win. An awful lot of really bright people out there, many of whom make horrible mistakes when it comes to investing money. So for me, being able to buy an ETF that gives exposure to a broad swathe of underlying companies, when I understand the logic for picking the name, I understand the logic for weighting the portfolio, absolutely fits the bill. Sure. And same question for you. Like, is ESG, do you approach with more, are you telling your clients more of a long-term focus when they're allocating to it? Definitely. We, and, uh, we look very closely at what um, James mentioned, the long-term growth potential. We also want to make sure we're looking at all the different potential tailwinds that can keep the story alive and, and is a, uh, not a short-term tactical play. And then we, of course, uh, spend a lot of time with clients to make sure that it's something that we take a lot of attention to, we consult with clients, and if clients are willing to act, then that really is a formula for success yeah, for us. Sure, and we sort of see that in the US, and ESG's been a little bit slower to adopt there, but what we notice from the flows is that when money goes into an ESG ETF, it tends to stay there, right? It's not really, people aren't trying to time ESG, right? So more it's like the way they're thinking about strategically their allocation. So. Can we just pause on this? Yeah, because I sure. Think it's a really interesting question here because I view ESG as an opportunity to control risk and to add value across the piece. Yeah. And I think that there is an additional aspect of exchange traded funds that sometimes is described as ESG, which is much more about ethics, which is about trying to have positive impact. And I, I come across a lot of investors who look at thematic exchange traded funds as an opportunity to try to make a difference in a non-financial sense, accenting something that is deeply embedded within the psyche of the investor. Sure. So did you have you want to Oh, add I just yeah. wanted to say that, of course, uh, ESG came from an ethical angle where you talk about values. And then there is the risk management of uh, in this changing world where there, uh, investors are less tolerant of incidents and corporate behavior. You have situations such as the mishandling of um, privacy and information from Facebook or Equifax. And you see that the stock prices actually get punished, whereas before in Exxon Valdez, there was almost no impact on the stock price. So uh, it is a risk management tool. Um, the world is changing, investors are changing, and therefore, why would you ignore the signal? So Point. I have to say that there is a values uh. and ethical angle, but definitely the financial relevance is what's making it um, coming to scale. Sure, so there's always a lot of good stories out there, meaning that I can assure you issuers are not gonna stop launching products, right? These sort of the one-off thematic products. What? At what's the tipping point? So like, when does a good story actually become like a good investment? So wh why do you sort of filter through that noise and saying this is just, this is a fad versus this is actually something that's much bigger. There's like a structural change. There's something bigger happening. Sort of what are some of the things that you look for to say that this is actually for real? Well, I want not only to know that it's real, but it's not replicating exposures that I have elsewhere in a portfolio. So I don't want a theme which is actually broadly accessible through conventional securities. And, and therefore, if we were to come back to the challenge of what is factor investing relative to what is thematic investing, I don't want something that is reasonably straightforward. I also want something that has real legs and an economic rationale for the long haul. So I was not a supporter of the marijuana. ETF, because it did not strike me that there was a genuine long-term opportunity to make supernormal returns that couldn't be replicated with individual corporate selection. Uh, and in contrast, I absolutely would hold my hand up and say that I don't understand who's going to win in biotech. Clearly, there'll be some winners and some losers. I'd much rather leave that to an ETF where I can get diversified exposure. I am confident that there will be people looking at metrics that over the long run will play out well. And as long as I understand how the security is being selected and how the portfolio weighting is positioned, then I'm in a position to make an informed decision. You might have an angry mob of marijuana <laughs> ETF buyers. <laughs> oh, I hope so, because it <laughs> it's what makes a market, isn't it? Right, exactly. <laughs> Same question on ESG, though. Sort of how do you guys, what are some of the things you look at to say, hey, this is like a much bigger something much bigger, something than just like a fad. Right. We, uh, again, we talk to the clients, but we also look to make sure that a theme is has a long-term growth story, but also that it's not too narrow. We're looking to make sure it has uh, some scale to it. Um, and if you don't have the liquidity and you don't have the momentum, you don't have all the clients on board, then really it's not going to be a successful product. So this, all of these things are, are crucial. And I wanted to touch on what James also mentioned. You have to know the exposure of the products or the indexes that you're 
you're um, investing in, a lot of these are more narrow, and therefore you want to understand what it is the factor exposure, what kind of quality or size you might have, what kind of sector exposure you may uh, inadvertently or <laughs> intentionally gain, and uh, be able to then fit it into your asset allocation based on knowing what your exposure is. Sure, and we'll get into a little bit later on yeah. onto like the like how you allocate it, but it's funny you mentioned that because this is not a joke, a vegan ETF like filed in the US. And you know what the top three holdings are? They're Apple, Microsoft, and Alphabet. So like, I think that really goes to your point. It's like you have to look through these holdings and making sure that you're getting the right exposure. So I want to do a quick polling question because we heard from them sort of the ideas that they like, sort of let's hear from the audience, sort of like what the, and you can't say marijuana. It's not one of the options. Uh, sort of what are some of the things that uh, thematically. It would be too popular. Yeah, that you guys would be interested in. We'll just give it a second to load. And if you, not enough of you answer, we're going to have the robot come in here and <laughs> pull. All right, so maybe the robot is voting because it's technological disruption. <laughs> but um, I mean, does that really surprise you? Just, I mean, maybe because technology is such a big part of our lives now. I mean, did you expect maybe that that's such a, a big focus even from the from the viewers here? It doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, after all, investors who buy capitalization-weighted passive products, whether ETF or structured otherwise, necessarily are going to end up buying the current industrial structure, and they will necessarily overweight the most expensive stocks and underweight the cheapest stocks. It's a sad reality of cap-weighted indices. And therefore, when one thinks about, so what might be different in 10, 20 years time from where we are today, it seems to me that technology disruption is key. And overweighting a portfolio to that sort of theme, I think predisposes investors to superior long-term returns. Sure. Now, I want to pivot a little bit, and I want to talk, I want to leverage your experience on the product side, right? And something that always fascinates me is collecting data on ESG, right? So it's not like it's in a 10K and it's like audited financial data, sort of how does MSCI sort of collect this ESG data? How do you analyze it? How do you maybe build an index off of it? So can you maybe like walk us through some of the things that you guys? I, I definitely do? think that's part of the big um, revolution that's happening is the availability and explosion of data that's available that is systematic, that's collected with um, a, a, a consistent way across markets and that has not been available in a quality way for a long time and so having this data which we collect using um, analysts uh, only about a third of our data is voluntary disclosure so the rest is really additive from an analyst point of view and then we take technology to try to scale that even further with AI a natural language processing to make sure we bring in as much of the information as possible uh, collected in a high quality way but most most importantly, we're looking for data, not just random pieces of data, but data that we think is financially relevant for each industry. So sure. financially material, again. So do you see a trend that maybe that data is going to start being like reported on like SEC documents or anything like that? Do you ever think that we'll get to that place that, because sort of now we distinguish investing and ESG investing. Does ESG investing just become investing? I think there is a language barrier of uh, ESG being labeled in the U.S. P potentially as a, a tree hugging <laughs> exercise sure. that it, it started several, uh, say, uh, 20 years ago. Um, really, it's just additional data um, that provides more signals. Uh, it's great indication of risk management that I think if it, your um, securities could get hit by some of these incidents that we have shown uh, could actually happen. Why would you not? Why would you ignore that signal? And as more and more regulation is forcing uh, more disclosure, that's helpful. But uh, I think there are analysts who really are beginning to say ESG is not alongside the investment, but it's fully integrated into a lot of what they do as part of risk management and, and maybe more. Sure, I think that's an important distinction versus like that being in your whole process versus a more thematic one like clean energy diversity, right? Which versus like all encompassing. Maybe you can both chime in on that. And when it comes to product construction, and we sort of saw this in the previous panel on like the factor ETF. So sometimes there's a disconnect between getting like the purest possible exposure versus fitting in something very nicely into like a, a portfolio, right? So like you have some ETFs that are very concentrated. How do you guys sort of balance 
getting a pure exposure to something, but also making it easy to fit into like a portfolio context. Well, I'm, I'm looking absolutely at the portfolio context, and therefore if we were to talk about what we know of climate change data, you publish a huge amount of climate change data. We absolutely yeah. understand the risk of climate change on company returns. So as a, a methodology for tilting portfolios towards a lower carbon future, we already have bags of information. However, where I think that ETFs come into their own is trying to think about who's going to positively support a better tomorrow. How can we deploy capital into solutions as opposed to don't give them any money, they're going to burn it? Uh, and that, to me, is a really important part of the ETF landscape. Yeah, and sort of with you guys, how, what kind of goes into when you're building an ESG index, balancing between getting this exposure but also making sure that they can easily allocate to it? Absolutely. I think there are different uh, stages of different types of ETF uh, investors out there. You have ones who want to replace your market cap and say, well, we want to have exclusions included in that. Then you have ones who have are very strong believers and they want to have only the best in class. And so it depends on what your objective is. Uh, we work with a lot of the wealth CIOs, for example, who are building model portfolios and they want to fit uh, the ESG within their model portfolio. So importantly, you, we need to understand what is the exposure of factors, of uh, what tilts and biases might exist so that you can allocate and then maybe you can find a way to rebalance your portfolio back. Um, we've also worked with big ins institutional investors, um, big pension funds who put it alongside because they have uh, requirements to do uh, some efforts in diversity and they have you know, a women's investment fund or they have a climate pool. And, and so it might sit alongside uh, the asset allocation. Sure. Now, I really want to rely on you for this. So let's just, I'm going to use robotics, for example, because there's so many different robotics products, right, in the US, even here. How do I judge? that I'm actually getting, if I'm picking an ETF, what goes into your due diligence process to make sure that you're getting actual robotics exposure? Like if I'm buying the vegan ETF, I'm getting a, one that's masquerading as a tech fund. How are you making sure that you're actually getting exposure to that, whatever the, that There is. is no substitute for lifting the lid and having a good look inside and interviewing the managers at length as to how they're going to select securities and also how they're going to weight the portfolio. And I completely agree. There are going to be an awful lot of charlatans out there who join the bandwagon and say, look, let's call it this because we think we can drive some flows. And that does the industry no good because it will create a bad name and people will think, well, do you know, this is just snake oil. And therefore, we're going to have to be very selective and we're going to have to work with the best quality suppliers, and, and some of them are here today, who have excellent due diligence themselves in how they select companies. And they have to very transparently tell us and we then have to agree that that definition is what we're looking for. So to you, this is going to be one of the other questions that security selection to you matters more versus like just getting the beta exposure. If I want exposure to robotics, do I need to look at the security you selection? You absolutely need to look under the bonnet of the ETF. You need to see the securities. You need to understand the risk characteristics. And then you need to aggregate it back into the portfolio to see whether the overall shape of the portfolio conforms with your investors' uh, requirements. Sure. And for me, there is no substitute for rolling up your sleeves to get the job done. Sure. Does it make it difficult? Because we always think about allocating in the sector framework, geography. Well, you do, I do. Uh, you, you belong in the dark <laughs> ages. I think the world's moved on. And I think <laughs> factors and themes are really important sources of, of incremental and aggregate risk. And we need to have a much broader understanding of the axes of risk participation so that when there are downturns or unsatisfactory outcomes, we know what to do and we know how to control risk. Sure. One, on ESG, one thing we hear a lot in the US is the, a client will come to us and say, this ESG product, if it's a US one or ACWI, it's underperforming the broader benchmark, right? Is performance the wrong way to look at it, right? You, are people maybe too focused on performance and they're sort of forgetting like, what the actual, the bigger theme is here? Do, like, do you guys come up with that a lot? I'm not saying that ESG is always underperforming, but we see that sometimes in the US. Right, and I, that, that question comes up quite a lot and tobacco stocks is a good example of that. In the past, uh, tobacco stocks made a lot of money and it was a, a very good quality stock in terms of the um, profitability. Um, but some would argue that maybe that should not be in the portfolio. So it depends on the investor's interest. Do they want, do they believe that should be in the universe or should it not? And when you answer that question, then you should have a, a different benchmark. 
We've worked with big pension funds who have said, well, we take tobacco out of our benchmark because we never invested it in the first place and therefore it's a more fair benchmark. So ultimately, we don't, uh, number one, the benchmark should meet the objectives of the investor. And in Europe, there's so much exclusions that are happening that if the benchmarks don't capture those exclusions, then it's not a fair benchmark, full stop. Sure, so you're saying and it's even a comparison problem, like we should I stop. Think the comparison. I, I'm going to butt in on this point, because oh, I, I would suggest that uh, companies that exhibit strong ESG characteristics predispose themselves to outperformance, not underperformance. And I think tobacco is unusual insofar as Tobacco was much more about ethics. It was much more about people don't like it. And the selling off of tobacco created cheap stocks that then generated outperformance. ESG, I think, is very different. And I think ESG is about risk participation. And dialing down risk because you're not being paid for it. It's unmitigated. It's unwanted. It's unwarranted. And most importantly, it's uncompensated. Therefore, ESG is, I think, a really good source of value added. I don't really need to be here. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, that, that's, that's a fantastic point. And I think um, for the number one factor that we consider is actually in the risk management because we do think that the risk consideration of ESG is uh, something that we have been able to consider. In the U.S., we have an index uh, called the KLD 400, and that was created 28 years ago. We didn't expect that index to perform at par with the um, with the S&P 500 or the uh, MSCI USA. Um, but over 28 years, the performance has been similar or even outperformed, and that May that last. is a live asset <laughs> test. Um, but again, similar to a minimum volatility portfolio where you have lower volatility in the long term, you know, with the bubble cycle, that could be a source of um, outperformance. But we're not focused on the outperformance. Oh, no, see, portion. I think Menvol is going to fall apart <laughs> because I think as bond yields go up, so Menvol will not deliver. I think that ESG and other themes, on the other hand, have real legs and are really important parts of delivering long term performance.